أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا مظلوم يا شهيد يا غريب كربلاء يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأتبع في هذه لعنة ويوم القيامة وبئس الرفد المرفود صل على محمد وعلى محمد A second for the love of Imams <coughs> Al-Hassan wal Hussein A third for the love of Fatima Al-Zahra with your loudest voices Your friend's friend is usually your friend. And your friend's enemy is usually your enemy. This is something common, not just in Islam, but in every religion, in every culture, even in international politics. If you have a friend, and that friend of yours has a friend, he'll be your friend, usually. And if your friend has an enemy, then he's also your enemy, not just your friend's enemy. This is logical. This makes sense. Wherever you go, this is a story. If you see that your friend is speaking to your enemy, or has befriended your enemy, you feel backstabbed. You feel betrayal. This person is betraying you. How can your friend speak to your enemy? This doesn't work. This is a sign of loyalty. We human beings, we show loyalty by befriending our friend's friends and by taking our friend's enemies as Enemies, it's a sign of loyalty. 
you wouldn't expect your best friend to speak to your enemy. And your best friend would never expect you to speak to his or her enemy. This goes without saying. This is not restricted to a, a particular faith or to a particular culture or to a particular civilization. It exists everywhere. Even in international politics. That's why one day we heard the President of the United States of America, one of the Presidents, well-known President, he stated, you're either with us or against us. If you're not with us, and if you befriend our friends, then that means you're against us. This works in politics. If the United States of America wages war against the country, the United States of America has an ally, the United Kingdom. They have an alliance. When one of them goes into a war against a certain country, it is expected that the other country also goes into war. This is what alliance means. They have a pact. An ally means that when you go into war, they go into war. When you're safe with a country, they're also safe with that country. This is an alliance. This works. Perhaps the other country will not even ask why. Why are you going to, into a war in this country? But because there's an alliance, they do so. For example, now we see there's an alliance between Syria and Russia. They have a, a common enemy. They have a common opponent. This exists in international politics. Even in tribal systems, in countries where there are tribes, for example in Iraq, even in Afghanistan, in other places. If two tribes form an alliance, that means their enemies are the same. If one tribe has an enemy, and they formed an alliance with another tribe, that means that the other tribe also has to become an enemy with that other group, or with the third tribe. This is what alliance means. Now when we come to Islamic teachings, when we come to Furu' al-Din, we see that we have very two very important pillars of Furu' al-Din. The first is At-Tawalli min awliya illah and the second is At-Tabarri min a'da illah. The first is to be friend and follow the friends of Allah and the second is to become enemies of the enemies of Allah and to claim innocence from the enemies of Allah these are two important pillars of Furu' al-Din what is who are the enemies of Allah? we have Al-Tawalli min awliya Allah and Al-Tabarri min a'da Allah Awliya Allah, it's very well known. Prophets, Imams, these are all considered Awliya Allah, the friends of Allah, the companions of Allah. We are required to follow them and befriend them and respect them and love them. And at the same time, we are required to claim innocence and take as enemies and declare as enemies those whom are enemies of Allah. Al-Tabarri min a'da Allah. Okay, who are the enemies of Allah? Do we see people that are waging war against Allah? Has anyone declared war against Allah? Or sending drones and bombs against Allah? Who are the enemies of Allah? How can we distinguish? The enemies of Allah are those that fight Allah's message those that fight Allah's principles, those that fight Allah's religion, those are the enemies of Allah. Those who fight the Prophet of Allah, they are actually waging war against Allah. Those who are enemies of the Ahlul Bayt, they are enemies of Allah. 
because the Prophet and the Imams, they represent Allah on this earth. They are Allah's representatives. He who wages a war against the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, he's waging a war against Allah. Because it's not a, a personal thing. It's not a personal vendetta. Those who fought Rasulullah and they fought Amir al muminin and they fought the Ahlul Bayt, it wasn't personal. It wasn't personal. The reason why they fought them was because these special individuals, they represented Allah on earth. They represented Allah's message. If Amir al muminin was someone normal that went to work early in the morning, came back in the evening and didn't have anything to do with people and didn't have anything to do with religion. Do you think that he would have been cursed for 70 years in Damascus on the member? Would anyone would have cursed him? Would anyone would have fought him? Till today, people are paying the price of following Amir al-Mu'mineen. Till today, followers of Amir al-Mu'mineen are being massacred and killed because they have love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why? If Amir al-Mu'mineen was a random individual, none of this would have happened. But because he represents Allah, but because the Ahlul Bayt represent Allah on earth, they are fought. So how can we distinguish who are the enemies of Allah and the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt? Who are the enemies? I'll tell you who are the enemies. A person who stands in the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi while Rasulullah is on his deathbed and he says, bring me something that I can write you a will in which you will never be deceived after, you will never go astray after. And one of them says, The man is speaking nonsense. Is this person not the enemy of Allah? Is this person not the enemy of the Prophet? And this is, this is an incident, not a fabrication from the Shia, but it exists in Sahih al-Bukhari narrated by Ibn Abbas, and he calls it the tragedy of, which day? The tragedy of Thursday. Al-Raziyya, kullu al-Raziyya, mahala baynana wa bayna kitab Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Abbas would cry. He said the greatest tragedy fell upon us because of a man who didn't let Rasulullah write his will. Was it this man? An enemy of Rasulullah. When Rasulullah passes away, Rasulullah has not even been buried yet. They gather to the Saqifah of Bani Sa'ada to appoint a Khalifa after Rasulullah. And only 70 days prior to this incident, Rasulullah stops what over 100,000 Muslims in between Mecca and Medina in a place called Khum, Ghadir Khum, to appoint Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam as the Khalifa. 70 days after they gather at Saqifa to appoint a Khalifa. Are these people not the enemies of Rasulullah? Those who came and gathered wood and fire at the house of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam and the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen and they threatened to burn down this house. And they told that specific individual that Fatima al-Zahra is in this house. He said, so what? Is this person, is this individual not the enemy of the Ahlul Bayt and not the enemy of the Prophet? Those who seized Fadak 10 days after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and claimed and claimed that prophets do not leave inheritance. And that Rasulullah has stated, نَحْنُ مَعَاشِرَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ لَا نُوَرِّثْ مَا تَرَكْنَاهُ صَدِقًا No one had heard this hadith except one individual. Thousands of Sahaba lived. No one had heard this hadith, only this individual. These people are not the enemies of Rasulullah and Allah and the Ahlul Bayt. Those who led Amir al-Mu'mineen stay away from Khilafah for 25 years. 
and those who attacked the house of Fatima and broke the ribs of Fatima to Zahra and grabbed Amir al-Mu'mineen with ropes to the masjid to seek his allegiance by force. Are these people not the enemies of Allah and the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt? Those who allowed Amir al-Mu'mineen, forced Amir al-Mu'mineen to remain at home for 25 years and prevented Muslims from benefiting from the guidance and wisdom and knowledge of Amir al-Mu'mineen. These people are not the enemies of Allah and the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. Those who fought Amir al-Mu'mineen in the three battles, those who called for the Muslims to fight Amir al-Mu'mineen in certain battles and rode on camels and called for the fighting and death of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Were these people not the enemies of Allah and the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt? Those who poined, poisoned Amir al-Mu'mineen, those who killed Amir al-Mu'mineen and poisoned his children and killed his children, one generation after, after the next. These people are not the enemies of Allah and the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. Up till today, until today we see their progeny and we see their children, the massacres that they are committing in Iraq and in Pakistan and in Afghanistan and in other areas of the world. These are their children. These are their progeny. Are they not the enemies of Allah and the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt? But how is it that we claim innocence from these enemies? How is it that we denounce these enemies? How is it that we perform a tabarri min a'da Allah? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We claim our innocence from them and we denounce them. First of all, we have to recognize who they are. Number two, we have to expose them and say this is exactly what they did. Number three, we should not justify for their actions. There are some that unfortunately they justify for the actions of these enemies of Allah and the Prophet and the Muhammad. We should not make justifications for them. We should not send our peace and blessings upon them. We should not say, رضي الله عنهم أجمعين. May Allah be pleased with all of them. Be pleased with what? With one, any of these, with which one of these actions should Allah be pleased with? The attack on the house of Fatima? Or the killing of Imam Hussein? Or the poison of all of the Imams? Which of these actions will Allah be, be pleased with? <coughs> this is how we show our denunciation and rejection of such people and of such actions. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Some say, why is the stress and emphasis on at tabarri min a'da illa? Why? Why don't we just leave these people alone? Why don't we just emphasize on the virtues of Ahlul Bayt, on the teachings of Ahlul Bayt? and the biographies of Ahlul Bayt. And let's leave these people alone. Who cares about them? Who cares about them? Why do we mention them, mention their stories, and bother with them? Let them do whatever they'd like. We have the Ahlul Bayt, let's mention the virtues of Ahlul Bayt. There are some with this sort of mentality. And this is not correct, my dear friends. This is wrong. Why is it wrong? You see, and I, I said this, I made a, a signal to this during the Q&A. Imagine, my dear friends, if we didn't have day, or if we didn't have night, it was always day. Would we know the meaning of day? If it was always day, continuously, it's always day, we don't have night. Would we know the meaning of day? No. Because we don't have anything to compare it to. We know day because there's night. And we know night because there's day. Imagine if it was all night. We wouldn't even know what night is because we have nothing to compare it to. Imagine if there was no injustice. Would we know the meaning of justice? The only reason why we know the meaning of justice is because there's injustice. 
That's the reason. In order to understand anything, you have to know its opposite. Philosophers said, said this from before Islam. If you want to know something, know its opposite. Know its antithesis. Know exactly what is contrary to it. You will know that. That's how we know. How do we know the Ahlul Bayt? How do we realize who the Ahlul Bayt are? How do we appreciate the Ahlul Bayt? It's by knowing who their enemies are. It's by recognizing who their enemies are. It's by calling them out and exposing them and denouncing them and rejecting them. This is how we will know who the Ahlul Bayt are. And this is how will we this is how we appreciate the Ahlul Bayt. Imagine I gave this example to some of the youth. Imagine if there was no dialogue what do you appreciate DSL? You, pre you appreciate DSL because you know what dial up is. Do you appreciate first class if it wasn't for, eco for the economy class? You only appreciate it because there's an economy class, you appreciate first class. So on and so forth. You appreciate the opposite because of its opposite. Because you've seen the opposite. You've seen the other result, you've seen the other option. If you have only one option, if you've only seen one, you don't appreciate it. We appreciate the Ahlul Bayt because we've seen their enemies. We appreciate Imam Amir al muminins justice because we've seen what it feels like without Amir al muminins justice. We saw for 25 years what happened without Amir al muminin That is why we appreciate his justice. And perhaps, subhanAllah, perhaps this is one of the reasons Perhaps this is one of the reasons why the will of Allah allowed for others to come before Amir al-Mu'mini. Why? Perhaps one of the reasons is so that we may appreciate Amir al-Mu'mini. If Amir al-Mu'mini had come right after the Prophet, perhaps we would not have appreciated him. Thus, in order to appreciate the Ahl al-Bayt and to truly know who they are, know their opposites, know their enemies. Know what your options are. If you don't choose the Ahlul Bayt, this is the other option. The other option is Muawiyah. The other option is Abu Sufyan. The other option is Yazid. The other option is others and others. So which would you rather have? That is why my dear friends in Islam, we don't just have At-Tawalli min awliya Allah. There are some that think all they need is love for the Ahlul Bayt. That is it. Don't curse anyone, don't mention anyone else's name. Don't bother with, with anyone, with anyone else. Only have a tawalli min awliya Allah. No. We have a tawalli min awliya, awliya Allah. And at the same time we have a tabari min awliya Allah. The same way that we befriend Allah's friends, we have to see, recognize as enemies, the enemies of Allah as well. We have two components, we have two laws, we have two principles. Why do we hold on to one and forget the other? You can't love the Ahlul Bayt and have love for others, for their enemies. You can't, this is impossible. In some parts of the world, in some parts of the Islamic world, you know what they say regarding Imam Hussein? They say, our master Yazid killed our master Imam Hussein. <coughs> How does this work? How does this work? If Imam Hussein is your master, how can Yazid be your master? Sayyiduna Yazid qatala Sayyiduna Hussein. Some people in Egypt and other places of the Islamic world, now till today, they, they see Imam Hussein and Yazid both as their masters. How is this possible? Or some say, our master Muawiyah fought our master Imam Ali. How can they both be your masters? When they were enemies, when they fought each other, how is this possible? Once I was in Sham, one of the taxi drivers, maybe you've noticed when you go to Sham, every taxi driver, you know, he wants to show you around, give you a tour. So one of them, he said, have you, have you visited Habil? I wasn't paying attention, so I told him, which, which Habil? He said, Sayyiduna Habil, the one that was killed by Sayyiduna Qabil. 
our master Habib that was killed by our master Qabil. How does this work? How does this work? They are both your masters, they are both your leaders. But in this school of thought, that is okay. They've learned that it's okay. You can join between two opposites. You can love two opposites. You can accept both Ali ibn Abi Talib as your master and Muawiyah. That's fine. You can accept both Uthman as your leader and Abu Dhar al-Ghafari. That's fine. Even though they fought. Even though they were enemies. But that's okay. How does this work? Where is the logic in this? Where is the common sense in this? How can they both be your masters? In Islam, we believe you, you have the love of Ahl, if you have the love of Ahl Bayt, you cannot have the love of Yazid. You cannot have the love of Muawiyah. And you cannot have the love of those even bigger than Muawiyah. It's impossible. You can't love two opposites. You either have love for this or you have love for them. You can't join them. It's the same way that you can't have love for Allah and have love for the shaitan at the same time. Ask anyone, ask all Muslims, can you love Allah and shaitan at the same time? They say no. But you tell them you love Ali ibn Talib and Muawiyah, they say yes. They are both our masters. But they fought each other and they killed each other. How is this possible? Where is the logic in this? Unfortunately, we are logical. Some Muslims are logical in everything. At work, they're logical. When it comes to business, when it comes to making money, when it comes to school, they're logical. But when it comes to faith and religion, they put their minds on the shelf. They turn off their minds. Where's the logic in this? Islam is a logical religion. Islam is a reasonable religion. Salah ala Muhammad wa This is why we believe in At-Tabarri min a'da'illah. That number one, this is loyalty to Allah, to the Prophet, and to the Ahlul Bayt. To befriend their enemies, you're being disloyal. This is disloyalty. This is backstabbing them. It's backstabbing the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt by befriending their enemies. This is one. Number two, at tabarri min a'da'illah is a form of is a form of rejection of falsehood by the rejection of the followers of falsehood. When you reject certain individuals, you're actually rejecting falsehood. You're not rejecting them as, as certain individuals. It's not a personal issue. We don't have anything personal with Yazid. We don't have anything personal with Muawiyah. Who cares what he did on his personal level? But we care when he claims to represent Allah and the Prophet. Here we draw the line. We care if his actions have greater repercussions. If he takes certain stands against Allah and the Prophet and the Hibayt, we care. Our fight with them is not personal, my dear friends. We don't have a personal issue with Yazid. We have an issue with Yazid with, for what he stood for. And what he symbolizes. Thus, when we reject Yazid, when we reject Muawiyah, and when we reject those even above them, we are rejecting falsehood by rejecting the followers of falsehood. We are making a, an emotional and psychological disconnection with falsehood by a tabarri min We are saying we don't want to have anything to do with this. This is a tabarri min we are distancing ourselves from falsehood by distancing ourselves from the followers of falsehood. This is the philosophy behind at tabarri min a'da'illah. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A prominent feature of at tabarri min a'da'illah we believe is la'an. It's to curse. But what does cursing mean? One of the prominent features of at tabarri min a'da'illah is to curse and to say la'an. To do la'an on whom? On the enemies of Allah, the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. But first let, let us understand what is la'an. 
Some people think that la'an is to use foul language. It's to use vulgar language. This is not la'an, my dear friends. La'an is not to say that so-and-so, his mother was this, his father was that, and to name call. No, 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 no. This is not la'an. Many people have understood, have misunderstood the concept of la'an. La'an is not, see they've confused two concepts. La'an and sab. Sab in Arabic means to use foul language to swear. La'an is not to swear, it's to curse. And there's big difference between to curse, between cursing and swearing. Sab, swearing is to use foul language. This is not allowed in Islam. This is not allowed in Islam. First of all, it is not allowed to swear against a mu'min, a believer. Subhab al mu'mini fusuk. If you swear against a mu'min, you become a fasiq. And you cannot swear against even disbelievers. وَلَا تَسَبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا The Quran says, do not swear against those disbelievers who do not believe in Allah. And we mentioned in a couple of nights, a couple of nights ago, that Amir al-Mumin would tell his companions, أَكْرَهُ لَكُمْ أَن تَكُونُوا قَوْمًا سَبَّابِينَ I do not want you to be a group of people that swear, that use foul language. No, your language has to be clean. Your words have to be clean. And I say this to the youth. And unfortunately, I've said this before, that on social networking, I see some of our youth, those that attend majalis, Maybe not in this community, in other communities. Our youth that attend majalis, they use foul, vulgar language. They use foul language and they swear. The ugliest, the ugliest thing is when I see some of our youth, Shia youth, use foul language. Especially if it's a female that has hijab on. Yet she uses foul language. This is the dirtiest thing. It's the ugliest thing. I hope this doesn't happen in our communities. Thus, there's a difference between la'an and sab. Sab is to use vulgar language, foul language. La'an is something else. What is la'an? La'an is a form of dua to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove his mercy from such and such individuals. When you say la'an on some people, you are asking Allah not to forgive them, not to be merciful with them. It is not something inappropriate. Some, some people say, no, 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 don't do la'an. This is inappropriate. This is not nice. Be respectful. There's nothing disrespectful about la'an. There's something disrespectful about using foul language. Sab. There's nothing disrespectful about la'an. La'an is to ask Allah not to be merciful. Doesn't when someone hurt you or bother you, don't you say, may Allah not forgive you? We say this. In Arabic we say, Allah lay samhak. In Farsi we say, Khuda taro turun nabakshin. We say this. We say to our, to our wives, our husbands, our children, our neighbors. We say it all the time. May Allah not forgive you. This is la'an. To ask Allah not to forgive. Not to be merciful. To remove His mercy on certain individuals. This is la'an. This is part of at tabari min a'da Allah. One of the components of at tabari is to say la'an. You tell me, where, where has this concept come from? I tell you that this concept of la'an is right in the Qur'an. Its original source is the Qur'an. I once did a search when I was preparing this speech. I did a search and I found that there are 38 verses in the Qur'an that contain la'an and cursing. 38 verses that contain the word la'an or one of its forms. For example, Allah curses shaitan with the word la'an. Allah curses disbelievers. Allah curses those who conceal the truth. And Allah curses the hypocrites in the Quran. For example, in one verse, وَقَالُوا قُلُوبُنَا غُلْفٌ بَلْ لَعْنَهُمُ اللَّهُ بِكُفْرٍ They said our hearts are covered. Allah says, but Allah curses you. In another verse, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا بَيَّنَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ فِي الْكِتَابِ 
those who conceal the truth. After we show, we show the truth in the book, those Allah will curse them, and those who curse will curse them. And another verse, مَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمْ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضَبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَلَعَنَهُ He who kills a believer, then he shall live in, in hell, in hellfire forever. Allah will be angry with him and Allah will curse him. A person who kills a believer. Let, well, remember this verse, we will need it later on at the end. A person who kills only a regular believer, Allah curse him. Now imagine if that believer was one of the whom? Was one of the Ahlul Bayt. In another verse, أَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ كُفَّارُ أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهُمْ لَعْنَةُ اللَّهُ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ Those who lived, those who were disbelievers and died as disbelievers, Allah will curse them, the angels will curse them, and all people will curse them. Regarding hypocrites, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُنَافِقِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ وَالْكُفَّارُ نَارَ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا هِيَ حَسْبُهُمْ وَلَعَنُهُمُ اللَّهُ Allah has promised male hypocrites and female hypocrites. This is, an, this is an emphasis. Allah could have just said hypocrites, but He makes an emphasis. Male hypocrites and female hypocrites. Because they weren't just male hypocrites, they were female hypocrites as well. Who was in the battle of the Jamal? Let's think. The Quran is being very accurate. Male hypocrites and female hypocrites. And kuffar, Allah has promised them hellfire, that they shall spend eternity in, and Allah will curse them. <laughs> Thus, the practice of cursing, the practice of Allah, is not something that our scholars made up with something new in the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt. No, no, it exists in the Quran. It exists in the Quran. The Quran curses and says La'an on several categories. When we look at the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi We see that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi cursed certain individuals. He said la'an on certain individuals. For example, those who deal with interest, those who pay interest or take interest, Rasulullah cursed them. Those who deal with alcohol, sell, buy, grow, carry alcohol, Rasulullah cursed them. Those who take bribes and offer bribes, Rasulullah cursed them. We have a hadith in both sources, Sunni and Shia sources, Rasulullah cursed them. We have a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi during his salah, in his qunut, there were three individuals that he used to curse, he used to say la'an. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Go read about them. In the book, Kinz al-Ummal, it's a Sunni source of hadith. It's similar to our Usul al-Kafi, for example, or Bihar al-Anwar. In Kinz al-Ummal, the author mentions that Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al muminin of course he doesn't call him Amir al muminin this is from me, that Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, he would curse four individuals in every salat in his qunut. One of them was Muawiyah. One of them was Amr ibn al-As. One of them was Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. One of, and the fourth was Abi A'war al-Silmi. These were four individuals that Amir al-Mu'mineen would curse in his qunut, in his salat. This is in Kenz al-Ummar, a Sunni source. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he ordered the army of Osama to leave Medina, he was on his deathbed. He was on his deathbed. News came to him that the top Sahaba, so and so and so, certain individuals, go read about them. They were not leaving. They are not joining the army of Osama and they're remaining in Medina. Of course, there was a conspiracy. Of course, because they knew that Rasulullah was about to die. They knew why Rasulullah was sending this army outside of Medina. I mean, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted these certain individuals to be outside of Medina so that when he dies, 
it will be a, tr a it will be a peaceful transition to whom? Tamir al-Mumin. They knew this. They knew that this was a plan by Rasulullah. How did they know this? Because there were certain spies in the house of Rasulullah. There were two spies in the house of Rasulullah. They would give information out. Thus, some of these top Sahaba, they refused to join the army of Usama bin Zayd. Rasulullah comes to the masjid being carried by Amir al-Mu'mineen and Ibn Abbas. His feet was crawling on the floor. He could barely walk. He came and he stood in front of people and he said, Mali ara. Mm. He said, and this is this has been mentioned in Sunni sources. Jahizu Jaysha Usama. Allah man an Jaysha Usama. Go, go with the army of Usama. May the curse of Allah be upon those who do not join the army of Usama. This is mentioned in, in Sunni sources. And most Sunni sources. This has been mentioned. Go see who didn't join the army of Usama. Rasulullah curses them publicly in front of everyone. Allah man an Jaysha Usama. Thus, it's... La'an is part of the Qur'an, it's part of the Sunnah. And it's part of the tradition of the Ahlul Bayt. There are those who follow the, the school of thought of the Ahlul Bayt and they say, enough, we should not do La'an. We should not curse anyone. While we see tens, if not hundreds of a hadith by the Ahlul Bayt that say, curse the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. A hadith say that when you drink water, send your salam on Imam Hussein and then curse the enemies of Imam, curse the killer of Imam Hussein. We have a hadith that says this. Tens of a hadith that say curse the enemies of Ahl Bayt. Most of our ziyaras, in our ziyarat, in our supplications, many of them they contain cursing, la'an, on the enemies of Allah, the Prophet, and the Ahl Bayt. Salli ala Muhammad wa Allah. Thus, tabarri min a'da'illah is just as important as atawalli min awliya'illah. You can't pick one and neglect the other. Both are important. The same way that we show our love and respect and we follow the friends of Allah, we have to show our dissatisfaction and our, reje and our rejection and our denunciation of the enemies of Allah and the Prophet and the Ahl Bayt. It's a sign of loyalty and it's a sign of rejection of falsehood. And la'in, the cursing of these individuals, the enemies, it's a form of tabarri min a'da'illah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now there are some, and I... There are some from the school of thought of Ahl Bayt, let alone other individuals, let alone followers of other schools of thought. There are some individuals in the school of thought of Ahl Bayt that have an issue with Ziyarat Ashura. With Ziyarat Ashura. Why? Because Ziyarat Ashura contains what? La'an. And cursing of certain individuals. Of course, without name. Some individuals are named and some individuals are not named. We have some followers of Ahlul Bayt today that reject Ziyarat Ashura and say Ziyarat Ashura is not authentic and it should be rejected and we should not recite Ziyarat Ashura. Or at least we should not recite the part that contains la'an and cursing. There are some individuals that say this and are preaching this. And I remember a couple of years ago in the UK at one of the Islamic centers on the day of Ashura when the Ziyarat of Ashura is recommended to be recited Ziyarat Ashura is recommended to be recited every day throughout the year but especially on the day of Ashura a fight broke out between the followers of Ahl Bayt some said let's recite Ziyarat Ashura others said let's recite another Ziyarat it's, a, it's, a, it's astonishing why? because it contains cursing and not is Ziyarat Ashura authentic? Should we recite it or should we not recite it? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. 
absolutely we should recite Ziyarat Ashura. The answer is, is obvious. If we ask any of our maraja, any of our top maraja, they will tell you, don't just recite Ziyarat Ashura on a daily basis, but tell others to recite. Some of our maraja have defended Ziyarat Ashura very fiercely. Ziyarat Ashura should not be neglected, and it should not be divided as well. Don't read some parts and neglect the others. Ziyarat Ashura is, a, is an authentic ziyarah narrated by Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. And we can prove its authenticity. How? Number one, we can prove the authenticity of Ziyarat Ashura, including the la'an and the cursing. How? First of all, when a hadith, any hadith, and Ziyarat Ashura is a hadith, it's narrated in a hadith. When any hadith is narrated in several sources, this means what? This means it's authentic. If a hadith is only mentioned, for example, let me give you an example. If you hear something on the news, for example, if you hear that some president died, you go on CNN, it's not there. You go on BBC, their website, it's not there. You go on several websites, this piece of news doesn't exist. But there's some really weird news website that mentions the story. Isn't that a bit fishy? It's a bit fishy. You're not going to believe it. But if you went on CNN and you saw the news, you went on BBC and you saw the news, you went on a bunch of websites and the news was there, don't you feel certain that this event took place? It took place because the sources are abundant. It's not just one source. When we come to Ziyarat Ashura, it doesn't just have one source. It has several sources, authentic sources, by top scholars like Ibn Qawdaway. He mentions it in his book, Kamil al-Ziyarah. Kamil al-Ziyarah is one of our most authentic sources. Like Misbah al-Mutahajjid by al-Shaykh al-Tusi. Al-Allam al-Hilli mentions it. Al-Shaheed al-Awwal mentions it. Al-Allam al-Majlisi in Mazar al-Bihar. There's a section in Bihar al-Anwar called Mazar al-Bihar. He's collected all of the ziyarahs. All of the ziyarahs. He mentions this. Over 18 or 19 sources that mention Ziyarat Ashura in its entire form. What does this tell you? That it's weak? That the cursing is weak? The ziyarah is weak? That we shouldn't read it? Or that it tells you that we are certain that it's been narrated by Imam al-Baqir alayhi This is one. Number two. To prove its authenticity. We have authentic ahadith that by the Ahlul Bayt that tell us if we are not sure if a hadith has been mentioned by the Ahlul Bayt or not to test the, auth the authenticity of any hadith the Ahlul Bayt gave us a guideline they gave us a rule what is that rule? to see that, is it compatible with the Quran or is it not compatible with the Quran? there are lots of hadith that say if you are not sure of the authenticity of any hadith See, is it compatible with the Qur'an or not? مَا وَافَقَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ فَخُذُوا What is compatible with the Qur'an? Take it. And what is not compatible with the Qur'an? وَمَا خَالَفَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ فَضْرُبُوهُ عَرْضُ الْجِدَرِ And if some hadith is not compatible with the Qur'an, then throw it against the wall. We come to Ziyarat Ashura. Which part of it is not compatible with the Qur'an? Which part? The la'an and the cursing. We stated that there are 38 verses in the Quran that mention la'an and cursing. Which part of it is not compatible with the Quran? Number three. One of the signs of the authenticity of Ziyarat Ashura is to see is it compatible with the other ziyaras and with the other ahadith of Ahlul Bayt. Right now, for example, if if, uh, if there's a lecture by a speaker, and this, this is a well-known speaker, you've heard other of his lectures, but this one specific lecture, you don't know, is it that same speaker or is it someone else? How do you know if it's him or not? You see, is it compatible with the other lectures, with the other speeches or not? If there's a book, you don't know who the author is, they say it could be so-and-so. 
and that so and so has lots of books and you've read them all, but you don't know, is this his book or not? What do you do? You see, is this book compatible with the other books? Is it the same? Is it the same tone? Or not the same tone? If it's the same tone, that, that means it's the same author. Ibn Abi al-Hadid al-Mu'tazili, who has a commentary on Nahj al-Balagha, he says, I can prove that everything in Nahj al-Balagha is by Imam Ali alayhi salam. It's not by Sharif al Because some say that some of the sermons in Nahj al-Balagha are by, are by whom? By Sharif al Radi, not by Imam Ali. Ibn Abi al-Hadid, who has a commentary, who's Sunni, he has a commentary on Nahj al-Balagha. He says, I can prove that it's all by Imam Ali. How? He says, look at them. It's like a flowing river. The lectures and the sermons and the short sayings in Nahj al-Balagha, it's like a flowing river. It all flows together. Obviously, it's the same author. When we compare Ziyarat Ashura to the other Ziyaras, it's like a flowing river. Compare Ziyarat Ashura to Ziyarat Wali. Or to the other ziyaras, it's very compatible. You can tell that it comes from the same origin, from the same author, from the same imam. Thus, there is no reason to doubt the authenticity of ziyarat Ashura. We come to the verse that we recited. The Quran says, "وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا." فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعْنَا He who kills a mu'min, just one mu'min, a regular mu'min. Not that his father, not that his grandfather is also a law, not that his mother is Fatima Tazara. He who kills a mu'min, then he will live in hellfire forever and Allah will be angry with him and Allah will curse him. We tell some of our Wahhabi friends, we tell them, why don't you curse Yazid? The Quran is saying, he who kills a mu'min, he who kills a mu'min, Allah will curse him. Is Imam Hussein a mu'min or not a mu'min? We ask you a question. If you don't accept him as an imam, if you don't accept him as a ma'asum, is he a mu'min or is he not a mu'min? Tell me. Is he less than the other mu'mini? Allah says, I curse him. You refuse to curse a person like Yazid who killed Imam Hussain They say, well, we don't know what happened on Ashura. We don't know what happened. We don't know who's right, who's wrong. We shouldn't get into politics. We shouldn't get involved in what happened on Ashura. It was a fight that occurred, and we don't know who's right, who's wrong. Let's leave it. But how come in, in the Battle of Badr, you know exactly what happened? In the Battle of Uhud, you know exactly what happened? How come in all other historic events, you know what happened? But when it comes to Ashura, you don't know what happened? All of a sudden, you get confused on what happened in Ashura? Is this right? Our Wahhabi friends, they curse Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Muhammad, the son of Abu Bakr, the son of the Khalifa Abu Bakr. Why? Because they claim he led to the death of Uthman. He instigated the death of Uthman, so they curse him. Even though his father is Abu Bakr and his sister is Aisha, yet they still curse Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr because he led to the death of Uthman. They don't say let's respect his father, his his sister, but because he killed, he led to the death of, even though this is questionable, who said that Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr led to this? But because he led to the death of Uthman, and he was a follower of Imam Ali, they curse him. We tell them, well, here's the grandson of Rasulullah, and Yazid led to the death of Imam Hussein. He doesn't deserve cursing, he doesn't deserve land. They curse a man by the name of Muslim, who in the battle of Jamal, he came to Aisha, Aisha was riding her camel, she was riding the, what's on top of the camel. In Arabic we call it Hodaj, I don't know what they call it in English. He opened it and he frightened her. They cursed this man by the name of Muslim because he frightened, he frightened Aisha. 
even though this is also questionable. But they don't curse the man who went and fight in Fatima to Zahra The one who fight in the Daru of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Why? Why? That's my dear friends, we can't befriend both. You're either on the side of Imam Hussein or you're on the side of Yazid. You can't choose both. We can't have both. And there were some on the day of Ashura that made it clear. We're either on this side or we're on that side. Some companions of Imam Hussein, they told him, we will stand with you till the last minute. Zuhair ibn al-Qayn tells the Imam that, Ibn Rasulullah, if, if I am killed, and they cut me into pieces, and they burn me, and they scatter my ashes, and I'm given life again, and this happens to me 70 times, I will remain with you, Abu Abdullah. This is a person that stood on the camp of democracy. And there was a person like Umar bin Sa'd, who, is, who, who didn't fight for principle. You think that he fought for a principle? What principle did he have against Imam Hussein? Umar bin Sa'd fought because he was promised the governorship of Tehran, the governorship of Ray. And he was promised some land, some money. He fought Imam Hussein. Until today, we have people like Umar bin Sa'd. Don't think that Umar bin Sa'd only existed on the day of Ashura. Till today, you think in Iraq we don't have people like Umar bin Sa'd that are given some money to kill individuals, innocent individuals? We don't have Umar bin Sa'ds in Pakistan or Afghanistan or in other places or in Bahrain. Till today we have people like Umar bin Sa'd. Umar bin Sa'd is not an individual, he's a concept. <coughs> Yazid is not an individual, he's a concept that lives, that, that lives every day. And Imam Hussein السلام, also became a concept. When it was time for the family of Imam Hussein to enter the battlefield, the first to step up was his son Ali al Akbar. Ali al Akbar was the first to enter the battlefield. Historians say that Ali al Akbar was 18 years old. He was young. He was Imam Hussein's oldest son. The oldest son, and you always have an attachment with your oldest son. The parents that are in our majlis, they know this. Your oldest son, you have a, an attach, a special attachment to him. Yet he came and he sought permission to enter the battlefield. The Imam didn't say no. When everyone else came to seek permission to enter the battlefield, the Imam made excuses. He made excuses. He told them, no, don't except his son Ali al-Akbar. When, when he came to seek permission to enter the battlefield, the Imam didn't say anything. Historians say that the Imam raised his head to the sky and his tears started flowing on his cheeks and on his beard he raised his head to the sky and he said, Allahumma jad ala ha'ula فقد برز إليهم غلام أشبه الناس خلقا وخلقا ومنطقا بنبيك وكنا إذا اشتقنا إلى نبيك نظرنا إلى وجه هذا الغلام Oh Allah bear witness on these people for the one who's closest to Rasulullah, to your Prophet, has come out to fight them. And if we were to miss Rasulullah, all we had to do was look at the face of Ali ibn al-Akbar. Now Ali ibn al-Akbar was about to enter the battlefield. Ali ibn al-Akbar enters the battle, he fights fiercely. He reminded them of the bravery and courage of his grandfather, Ali ibn Abi Talib. He entered the battle. Historians say that Layla, his mother, she came out of her tent. She wanted to see what will happen to her son, Ali al-Akbar. 
She did not have the heart to look at the battlefield. She would look at the face of Aba Abdullah. All of a sudden, she saw that the face of Imam Hussein became pale. She said, my master, has something bad happened to my son Ali? Imam said, no, but a champion has come to fight him, and I fear for the life of Ali. Oh, Layla, go back to your tent and pray for your son. Layla came into her tent. She faced the Qibla, and she started calling to Allah. Ilahi bi ghurbati abi Abdullah Ilahi bi atashi abi Abdullah Ya radda Yusuf ila Ya'qub Rudda ilayya waladi Ali Oh Allah, I ask you by the loneliness of Aba Abdullah What a vow, what a vow she was making Oh Allah, I ask you by the thirst of Abba Abdullah. Oh, the one who returned Yusuf to his father Yaqub, return to my, return to me, my son Ali. Ya Rad Yusuf, min maghibah, aridan Ali, salim tajib. Allah answered the call of Layla, Ali al Akbar comes back to the camp. He comes back to his father, Imam Hussein. Abatah al Atashu qad qatalani, wa thiqlu al Hadid qad ajhadani. Fahalli, fahal min sharbatin ila al Ma'i Sabin. My father thirst is killing me, and my armor is killing me. Is there any water for me to drink? Historians say that Imam Hussein told his son to come close to him and to put his tongue on the tongue of his father to realize that his father is even more thirsty than him. And then he says, Ya Ali, before you enter the battlefield, go and say farewell to your mother Layla for one last time. He goes and he says farewell to his mother Layla. This is the last time that she will see him alive. This is the last time that she will see him in one piece. Ali al-Akbar goes back. Ali al-Akbar, he, he enters the battlefield. He starts fighting. All of a sudden, the enemies approach him from every direction. Muntad ibn Marwa approaches Ali al-Akbar and he hits him with his, with his sword on his head. Ali al-Akbar falls from his horse, but he remains attached to the horse. The horse can no longer see. The horse takes him to the enemy side. They gather from every direction and they begin to cut Ali into pieces. They cut his arms and they he cut his legs. Ali shouts to his father, Abata alayka minni salam. The Imam rushes to his son, Ali al Akbar. He comes down from his horse and he sees his son, Ali, in that state. He comes and he puts his cheek on the cheeks of Ali al Akbar. Waladi ala dunya ba'dak al afa. My son, life is not worth living after you, my son. Ala dunya ba'dak al afa. Laqad baqayta abuka wahida and gariba. Your son, you've left your father all alone in this life. You've left your, your father all alone in this world. Historians say that Imam Hussein noticed. Ali al-Akbar would look to his left and he would smile, he would look to his right and he would cry. His father asked him, my son, why are you smiling and why are you crying? He said, when I look to my left, I see my grandfather Rasulullah with a cup of water approaching me so I smile. But when I look to my right, I see my grandmother Fatima.